Welcome to another episode of Software Developer Diaries and today we're going to be centering a div. Let me explain why. I have this div here and I would really like okay. you to center it for me both vertically and horizontally on this page. So it's like right smack in the middle there. Basically we have Ben Awad, who was one of the biggest JavaScript YouTubers and Dan Abramov, a co-creator of Redux who also works in the React team and is an engineer at Facebook at the same time. Even though Ben said that he would hire Dan based on the interview at the end, Dan made quite a lot of mistakes as a Facebook engineer. A title that seems so holy for most of us, underrated developers with imposter syndrome. I'm definitely not judging Dan personally here because I respect his work and his great contribution to the open source community. And because we don't know the reasons why it was so hard to center a div, for example. Maybe he actually hasn't touched CSS in a while or hasn't solved any live coding challenges recently. You know, it's pretty common and understandable. I guess we all have failed interviews and sometimes we're not able to solve problems that later seemed trivial. But enough talking, let's go through the challenges that the guys were solving and see if we can solve them too. First of all, if you haven't seen the original video yet, you can check it out first. Otherwise, don't worry, I will explain all the challenges thoroughly anyway. And of course, you can pause the video whenever you want and try to solve the challenges at the same time if you'd like. Alright, so the first problem, centering a div. The first thing Dan goes for is using flexbox on the element itself, which would never solve the problem since attaching flexbox does not affect the element itself, but rather its children. Well, I think the first thing I want to do is just to make sure that it's actually... Then he actually realizes that and goes for the flexbox on the body element. Maybe this flex to the parent. We're getting very close. And then he remembers about React's root element, which is a div with an ID root. My body is 100%. Oh, there's a root there. Okay, so let's do this. And a minute later... Is the root needs to get bigger and needs to take over that entire screen. And eventually it then solves the problem. Other guy up there. Okay, okay, after that. Yeah, yeah, that worked. Uh, let me remove this. By no means, don't underestimate the CSS question because most of us use normalizers and we never have to deal with body or HTML tags. Essentially, what Dan was missing is that for the div with the ID root to take the whole height, the body needs to have a whole height. And for the body to take up the whole height, you guessed it right, the HTML tag needs to be the whole height. And by default, they aren't. And here is where it gets even more confusing. HTML tag is the only element which can take up 100% height without having a parent with the defined size in pixels. Also, if the HTML and body elements are not the full size of the page and you give them a background color, the background color will still take up the whole space. All right, let's see how Dan could have solved this with minimal code very fast. So we already have the same mockup from the interview with the body, HTML tags and a div with an ID root. Uh, which is coming from the React and a simple center me div. So what we're gonna do and um, also touch the points that I already mentioned with anomalies in CSS is that we will simply um, refer to HTML and body tags and give it a green background so that we can tra track the anomalies easier. Um, background color green and for this we already can open the elements uh, in the developer console and see uh, and, and inspect them. So I hope you can see my console. Do you see that HTML and body tags, body, body tag inside, do not take the whole space. They only wrap the center me div, which is super weird because we gave it a, gave it a background color green. Background color somehow takes up the whole space. But not, uh, but not the element itself. So for the element to take up the whole space, we still need to give it a height of 100%. And now when we open the developer console and look at the body and element, yeah, now they take the whole space. And this was kind of uh, the difficult moment for Dan to figure out which is totally understandable. Now we're gonna reference the div with an ID root. So for this we do div with an ID of root and we give it a height of 100 pixels as well. 
so that it's the same height as the body. And as soon as we've done this, let's just give it a different background color so that it's also easier to track. And you can see that it takes up pretty much the whole space. Uh, disregard this green border, it's the margin uh, coming from the body tag. And anyway, we will apply a uh, flex box to it. Display flex, justify content center, center and align items center. Yeah, now the div element is actually centered. That's it. And here's the official explanation for the anomaly with the background we just saw. In the absence of a background color of the HTML element, the background of the body will take up the whole space. That's why in normalizers, they usually put background white so that this anomaly does not come up. I gotta say, I would have probably been stuck on this problem as well, for a bit, just like that. And the next problem was inverting a binary tree. Basically, I want you to take every node, the left and the right node, and swap them. And Dan easily solved this problem by swapping the children and calling the function recursively. Well, not really. The function would error out as soon as it reaches the leaf node, which is the last node in the bottom of the tree. The reason it would error out is because the leaf does not have any left or right children, which means we missed the first rule when dealing with trees. Always cover the null pointer checks. So let's take the code that he wrote and extend it a bit. So the, so the main logic for inverting is already here and the only thing that we need to do, as we said, is to check for null pointers. So what we're gonna do if simply add an if statement, if node is null, which means if there are no children of a leaf and we're at the very bottom of the tree, we simply return and that's it and this way our algorithm would work. And the last, well, the main highlight of the interview was the jumping rabbit question. It's somewhat a simplified version of the scientific paper on hunters catching a rabbit. But instead of explaining it all myself, let's watch Ben's brief explanation of the challenge. So there is a hundred holes in a line and you can think of the holes as just like, you know, something like this. And this hole is index zero. This one's index one and so on all the way up to 99, right? Okay, okay. And there's a rabbit and it's hiding in one of these holes, okay? So you get the idea, you make a guess, you look into a hole, if the rabbit is there, then you catch it. If not, the rabbit can jump into one of the adjacent holes. My first thought here was, why is it taking Dan so long to figure it out? And it seemed like a binary search problem to me, and I was already ready to say the space and time complexity of my solution. O log of n. Basically we start at the very center and then we cut the number of holes by two and then the rabbit is at the edge and have nowhere to go. But I missed two main points here. First, we don't know the initial index of the rabbit, which means with a binary search we wouldn't know which direction to go. And the second, the rabbit is jumping after each guess so it can fool you by jumping back and forth. I would say pause here and think about a possible solution, don't even code anything. Well, if you're lazy like me and want to see the explanation, then sure, let's do it together. Basically Dan didn't manage to solve it on his own, he did it only after a number of hints from Ben. But still he tried to code the solution while thinking, which was kind of brave of him to do. So anyway, I will try to draw the explanation on the board but please excuse my terrible drawing skills. So these are the holes that the rabbit can jump to and let's for the sake of simplicity index them because indexes will help us with the actual solutions. So imagine the rabbit is on the index five and these are the ears of the rabbit and we make a guess, a random guess and we hit two. Obviously the rabbit is not there and you probably already know that it's pretty much impossible to make a correct guess if you have a hundred holes. Well, it's one out of a hundred chance, but it's very unlikely. 
So the most practical solution is simply to go from the beginning of the array till the end, like this, and hope that at some point we stumble upon the rabbit. But of course, if you guess four and the rabbit is on five and the next, the next move is on the rabbit, the rabbit can simply jump here and your next guess will be five. So rabbit basically passed you by. Yeah, I mean, if it's, so if we start, uh, so it's start like at 50, then tipo spawn is either 49 or 51. So it turns out, as we are making the first guess, if we make a guess on an odd number such as one, and the rabbit is also on an odd number such as five, and as we said, we're gonna look through the whole array. So we go to two, then rabbit makes a move, it jumps to four, we guess three because we're in a loop. And next uh, step is actual rabbits and it basically jumps over and we miss the rabbit. But imagine we take, uh, so the rabbit still starts from five, but we start from an even index from zero. Well, zero is not an even number, but still an even index in our case. And the rabbit is, it, 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 the rabbit is on five, we go to one, rabbit comes towards us, four, we are on two, rabbit decides that it should probably go back, actually, it's just a use case, we go to three, uh, rabbit jumps to back to four, let's say, doesn't matter again, and we catch the rabbit. So the whole idea here is that if the rabbit starts from an odd number, then in order to catch it, we should start from an even number and vice versa. If the rabbit starts from an even number, we should start, start from an odd index. But how do we make sure that all this even and odd um, loop aligns? The answer is simple. We actually need two for loops. One that's gonna start from zero and another one that's gonna start from one. This way, we doesn't matter whether the rabbit starts from an even or odd, odd index, we're gonna catch it in one of those two loops. And that's the whole trick. In fact, I did also pause on Ben's video to think about a possible solution myself, but after 20 minutes, I wasn't really able to come up with any good solutions. So I gave up. If you paused your video and managed to solve it, then of course, pat yourself on the back. If not, Brilliant can help you with this. Brilliant.org is an interactive platform where you can learn anything related to STEM, science, technology, engineering, and math. The keyword here is interactive. The courses you take are full of visual explanations which will help you learn six times faster than with ordinary video content. I'm currently taking a course on logic which should theoretically help me with this bunny problem in the future. Check out the link in the description to get started for free and if you like it, you can get a 20% discount for your annual subscription. Remember, investing in yourself always pays off in the long term. Thank you for watching this video and yeah, just let me know in the comments below if you were able to solve any of those questions that Dan and Ben were dealing with. I will see you in the next video and goodbye.